Uh, it's my great pleasure to be introducing Stephen Markowitz. Stephen is one of Africa's most pioneering producers. With over 20 years experience on feature films, documentaries, short films, distribution, and in festivals. He has an extensive production and distribution network across Africa and has co-produced with over 10 countries internationally and worked with over 100 international directors. Some of Stephen's films include Viva Riva, Proteus, Boy Called Twist, and the Oscar-nominated Inja, Dog. In most recent, and most recently, Beats of the Antonov, which is screening here at TIFF. Uh, Stephen is currently producing films in Kenya, Namibia, Ghana, DRC, Liberia, Malawi, and South Africa. Uh, we hear a lot of filmmakers um, complaining about how difficult it is trying to make films out of North, Africa, uh, North America and often feel like they, they're very hard done by. Well, speaking to Stephen, we, we now see it's a little harder in South Africa where resources are fewer and far between. And Stephen is here to, sh to share some of his successes with us and give us some tips. So please welcome to the stage, Stephen Markowitz. Uh, it's easier to talk about my failures than successes, but I'll do my best. Thank you very much. Why do we co-produce? A reason is obviously to access funds one can't get in one's own territory. It also gives us access to talent, expertise, markets, and market intelligence. But finding the right partner can be tricky. We meet producers at festivals. They seem charming. They have similar tastes. They may have made films that you admire, etc. However, many people have these festival personalities, and you only discover the true nature of someone once you start working with them, and they often turn out to be monsters. <laughs> a few years ago, I was at a party with some co-producers, the director, cinematographer, uh, on a film we were, work we were about to shoot. Uh, there were six or seven of us. We had set the date for the shoot. Uh, we were all laughing, drinking, dancing. We were having a good time. And this guy in the corner, an old cinematographer, called me over and he said, I've been watching you and you all look so happy together. I bet you that in one year's time, you won't be talking to each other. It took a little longer, but only two of us are still talking to each other. Um, I once co-produced a film with a European filmmaker. We, we raised money for him. He shot the film in South Africa and he went back to Europe to edit and we never heard from him again. He never returned our calls or emails. He finished the film, he entered it into festivals without ever sending us a copy. I don't even know if my name's on the film or if I even want my name on it, but uh, that's just an example of what can happen. So co-producers are, are partners for life on a film. You're gonna spend a few years of your life working with them. Uh, so if at the first dinner they start irritating you, get out of there. But I cannot emphasize enough the importance of properly researching their reputations, their work ethic, before you start working with them. Speak to people they have worked with before, check in with their funding bodies, and gather as much information and intelligence on them as possible without breaking any laws. Uh, Co-productions can often be arranged or shotgun marriages, so be very careful before diving in. One co-producer I worked with owed me money for over, well over a year, and had every excuse in the book. Eventually, I was, uh, it was a Portuguese producer, and I was in Spain, and I thought, I'm gonna hop over and confront her. So I called her up uh, once I got to Lisbon, and I said, I'm on my way to your office. Uh, she made the payment straight away, but she switched the bank details, so it wouldn't go through. After three attempts, she paid us almost in full. She still owes us a few thousand euros, uh, and I found out afterwards that she had ripped off dozens of people in Mozambique who never got a cent. Also found out later that she had a Versace and cocaine problem, so that's where our money went. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to sound cynical, but I've had co-producers lie, cheat, steal from films. So just be very careful. In the past two years, I've worked with directors and producers from 12 countries. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not gonna whisper. Um, and, uh, and it's generally gone very well, so hopefully it'll stay that way. We know that there are many kinds of funds for documentaries besides broadcasters. We know that uh, many public broadcasters' budgets are dwindling. 
Uh, there's tax shelter, regional funds, national funds, private equity, grants, gap, cultural funds, donor funds, equipment as equity, pre-sales, MGs, production rebates, etc. These are all possible for documentaries, and information on them are widely available. Uh, you know, it's easy to find information on this. Um, but it can get complicated when working with small crews, arranging the balance in spend and nationality against the artistic vision of the film. So you have to weigh up the question when co-producers are engaging with some of these sources. Is it really worth it? What are the costs of co-producing? Always be aware that the time frames will be much longer. You only co-produce because you have to out of absolute necessity if you are sure you cannot produce the film on your own. I mean, as an example, how the costs can eat up your budget, well, while there are many advantages to co-producing with France, they've got a very healthy support system, they charge a 68% tax on top of all labor, which can kill the budget. So sometimes I resent helping to finance the French social support system. In today's climate, we have to innovate. We have to find new channels of funding from non-traditional sources. Over the years, some of the films we produce have been supported from some unexpected sources, such as a Nigerian bank, a Congolese beer company, the Dutch lottery, a film festival, a coal baron, an oil baron, a wine baron, an association of polio survivors, a sleep doctor, a group of 800 individuals before online crowdfunding became a thing, and an heiress to a diamond empire. These supporters work with us because the idea for the film is clear. They know we are independent and that is a strength. It also, often, it also often allows us to hold on to equity on the film and develop the film further before taking it to the market. There's a potential funder for every film you make. Somewhere in the world, someone who has money has a direct or indirect interest in supporting your film. It's your job to find them and convince them. They are out there. You just have to get to them. The key for me is understanding what motivates people and organizations to support your film. You have to get to the bottom of that question and build an argument from there. It may be personal belief or personal interest, ego, guilt, moral outrage, the love of the arts, or internal policy. The danger is that we start refocusing our ideas to fit other people's interests. We'll lose our independence, which is what makes us attractive in the first place. Thank you. Well, before we get into a conversation, I, you just spoke. Are there any questions from the audience? No? We want a little more Stephen? <laughs> more tips, more war stories. <laughs> Stephen, I'm, I'm so curious, what kind of institutions that don't exist do you imagine that could be created to help facilitate co-productions? <clears throat> well, I think that uh, something I was talking about the other day is a need for an emergency documentary fund. And what I mean by that is there are so many films that need to be shot now mm. that are time sensitive. And the process of raising money normally takes three to six months with any funder having time to assess it, mm -hmm. I think there's a real advantage for a, for a smart funder who set up a fund to come in on films where something is about to happen. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be current affairs, but there's something that's about to unfold and they can get in with a strategic amount of money and come in and make that film really special. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that I think is really missing. I understand with most funds, there has to be proper assessment, proper due diligence, one has to go through that process, but I think there is a gap for a kind of speedy fund. Hmm. What, do, what do you think? I think it? that's, a, if there are some deep pockets in the room, that would be, there's a business idea, <laughs> and that'd be great. And I know you're so lucky you travel to a lot of festivals. We, we see you in Toronto very often. Your films often come here. What, how do you advise younger producers, maybe aspiring producers that don't get the opportunity to travel, how, how do they meet co-production partners? Well, <clears throat> look, I think it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Often when uh, I've, I spend about five or 10 years traveling mm -hmm. before I started actually working with people, it can often take a long time to build those relationships. But I think one should not be shy and one should go to more experienced producers and say, I have this project, you have this network, can we co-produce together, get them to exec produce or co-produce, but don't 
think, you know, if, you, if you're starting out, you need help to do it. I wish someone had helped me when I started out. Uh, it's really difficult on your own to build those relationships. So I would suggest engaging with more experienced producers, and I'm not looking for a job here, but um, <laughs> I think just to find a way to, to have someone who has that network and can get you into that circuit quite quickly. Right. And so, you know, you'd be open to maybe some younger Canadians approaching you afterwards with some ideas? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. Yes. And, and for, for the more experienced producers, can you tell us a bit more about that process? How do, you, how do you physically meet each other? Is it these speed datings at festivals? Is it through, you know, word of mouth? <clears throat> I think word of mouth is the best way. I think speed dating, you know, if I think how many speed dates I've been on, not personally, but in the business, <laughs> um, it's, I've, I've probably met, I don't know, like 1,000, 2,000 people. And how many, has, how many real relations have, have come out of that? Probably like three or four. So it's, it's a very kind of low hit rate. Um, and I think it's word of mouth is the best way. Is if you want to make a film and you think it's right to work with a particular country, you've got to do the research and spend your festival asking around. If it's a German co-production, you're going to go watch German films, you're going to go to their cocktail parties, you're going to go to all their talks, and just like immerse yourself and ask around and you'll pick up who the right people are. I mean, I'm about to co-produce a film uh, with Germany, and I, I spent about, about eight or nine months narrowing down who would be the best people to work with. And uh, so you go from 10 to five to three to one, and eventually you, you find that partner, and hope for the best. <laughs> and yes. hope for the best. <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? Yeah? There's one right at the front. I think, do we wait? For those, who, for those who didn't hear, this woman at the front reflects Stephen's experiences of the difficulties of finding producers. I'm, I'm so curious, you mentioned um, that you've, you've recently found a German co-producer. Are there any countries that you think are doing something particularly interesting or where you generally look towards when, when seeking co-producers? It depends on the project, but I mean, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday that in Canada, uh, I know there's quite a lot of support for kind of new media mm -hmm. funds and I think it's really smart that the government is investing in producers doing that because in five years time the expertise is going to be here. So that's, those types of new initiatives are really attractive. And I'm not just saying it because I'm in Toronto but <laughs> it actually is uh, a really smart move when people set up specific funds that are innovative and uh, can can uh, kind of create expertise amongst producers in this country, it's gonna be advantageous in the future. But, you know, recently we did a little film in Egypt and it was a co-production between Egypt, South Africa, and Macedonia of all places. So it, you never know where it's gonna take you. Uh, it's about what's right for the film and who the right partners are. But um, I think you've gotta assess each country very carefully and it all looks good on paper, but when you get into the detail and you actually break down what are the actual costs mm -hmm. associated, it can often be cheaper to just do it in your own country. Uh, so one's really got it. Everyone likes the idea of co-producing, and I've met a lot of European producers who like to, they've said it straight up, they like to co-produce because they like to travel to exotic places, you know? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, I'll just go on a holiday or something, but I mean, <laughs> You know, for, for me, it's, you one's got to have a bit more motivation than that. It's actually, there's got to be a real reason why you need each other. Like any relationship, any business relationship, if there isn't mutual respect and something that you need from each other, the chances of that working are very slim. Josh Braun from, from Submarine Entertainment was here last year talking about his experience in, is in the agency and I, I'm remembering a lot of his words echoing with what you're saying about trust about word of mouth, about being a good business partner. It's, it's really interesting. Um, there, there was another hand, I believe someone was handed a microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Can you, oh yeah. Um, 
So there's two parts. The first part is, the, is about money. Um, I'm doing a German co-production and we tried to bring in South Africa and make it a three-way co-production. But at the end of the day, that there just wasn't enough money to support that. And we would have loved it. And the three of us really did want to work together, but we just couldn't make it financially work, which is a shame because it's an African story. But, um, but that's the other thing. So the second part of my question is that it's not just about the money. It's about, it's about the, f the film, the narrative. And so um, it's often difficult to find the story that works in Egypt, Macedonia, South Africa. So could you talk a bit about the stories that you found did work with those co-production partners and the ones that just in the end couldn't work? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm really glad you brought that up because I think you can see it when you watch a film. Uh, often you can see, you watch a film that's shot in an African country, but it wasn't a co-production. Uh, it often lacks a certain level of authenticity because there's a kind of slight distance from having kind of underground knowledge uh, around local culture, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying it's impossible, but often one has a, um, a you know, if you're working with a good local co-producer and you say, I'm looking for up-and-coming musicians, or I'm looking for street artists, whatever, if they're in the know, they're going to find you the right people. If not, and you're working with a service producer who's just there for the check, they might not be, they're not as invested in the long-term health of that film, and it, it can impact on what you can get out of the film. Um, but, I mean, the Macedonia, Egypt, South Africa examples maybe not the best because basically what happened was we were shooting in Egypt and uh, there was an Egyptian cinemato uh, a Macedonian cinematographer He's incredibly talented, and we've, we wanted to work with him. And we found out uh, that there are s some quite decent funds in Macedonia if you co-produce with them. And there's some really talented technicians who've been to some great film schools, uh, but they're quite kind of divorced from the rest of Europe. So they were very happy with us to do that, and the, the films traveled to like 40, 50 festivals around the world and done really well. So. It's, uh, I'm all for Macedonia, I think there's great talent there, and uh, so I'd never thought of working with Macedonia before. But it, it's, it's also an interesting kind of question where, like South Africa, we just signed a treaty with Australia, and not much has happened on that treaty, and everyone's going, oh, what are we going to do? We've got to do something with Australia. But with, it's quite difficult to find stories. Uh, the countries are similar in some ways, there's a lot of similarities. And it's quite difficult to find stories that work in, in, uh, in both countries. I mean, I'm quite keen to do a film about all these racist whites who went to go live in Australia, but I don't know if the Australians are that keen about it. But I think that um, uh, it's, this, you know, it doesn't just have to be around the narrative of the story. It's about people you want to work with. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we all know it's, you know, one can meet people and are friends with people from all over the world. And if you have a kind of connection with them, you're going to find a way to work together. Um, so to me, obviously, if there's a natural story, it's great. But otherwise, I think it's just about finding partners you really trust and you have a similar artistic vision. Yes. Greetings. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm James. I made a, a documentary in South Africa uh, some time ago. And at that time, uh, the nature of trying to get together a co-production uh, was, um, I found the difficulty here made it impossible. Uh, we made the film anyways. It came to, let's make the film for less money or let's just talk to bureaucrats for another three years. So instead, we made the film. And uh, I'm wondering right now whether you have any direct experience of um, of working under whatever current arrangement there is between South Africa and Canada. <clears throat> yes, well, I've co-produced a feature film. That wasn't me, huh? Uh, I've co-produced a feature film with uh, Canada, uh, which was about 10 years ago. It was here in Toronto and in Berlin. And uh, it was a great experience. I mean, you know, I think if you, I was saying the other day that, that you know, generally, 
uh, working with Canada, I think there's quite a high ethical standard. There's a lot more integrity here than in some other systems. And uh, I mean, I'm not just saying it, but Canadians are nice, polite people. They're really easy to get on with. And there's really good support systems in this country. Um, so my experience was really, look, doing co-productions, it's very bureaucratic. You end up with files like this, but it's, it's a necessary part of the process. Uh, so my experience has been very positive, and there was a real political will on both uh, uh, sides, authorities on both sides, to make that happen. And I think that's really also important, is to, to speak to the, those authorities, and they need to be motivated uh, and, and get the bigger picture about why this film is important for both countries and, and working together. But I mean, what, what, what was the impediment for, for you? It was a film uh, about uh, apartheid and Canadian-Indian policy and the relationship between the two. And believe me, um, there was no appetite, um, <laughs> including from this building, to, uh, to see that film made for some time, but uh, others supported it. But it, to do it nationally uh, at that time, um, from a Canadian perspective, I think it was to some extent uh, political. Yeah, I can, I can understand that can happen, absolutely. But, you know, one can also co-produce outside of the official system. You know, I, with documentaries, it's often so expensive to do official co-productions and time-consuming mm -hmm. that we co-produce all the times with, you know, South Africa, for example, has no treaties with, uh, with any African countries, but we co-produce all the time with other African countries and they find some money from their country and we, or through their sources within their country and we find finance and work together. So it doesn't always have to be an official co-production. I often have people who come to shoot in South Africa and I'll you know, provide certain services, a little, I'll raise a little bit of money and uh, I'll get some rights for that, but I won't go through the treaty. It's just the budget's not big enough and the timing isn't there. So one can still form these partnerships without going through the officialdom. Yeah. Could you talk about your experiences of finding those channels that maybe aren't so obvious or national? Uh, you mean in other African countries or? Or anywhere. <clears throat> well, finding sources of finance or, yeah, well, you know, as I was saying uh, uh, when I was at the podium was that, you know, one's got to, f for every film I've ever worked on, there's always some organization or individual who will, you'll find their interest for that film. And uh, you've just got to work at it. Like, you know, we, we there's, uh, what I'm finding more and more is a lot more philanthropists mm -hmm. putting money into, into documentaries uh, who they might be uh, very politicized or have a particular cause, et cetera. And I think we in the past haven't done enough to, to find uh, people, especially in Europe, which doesn't really have a tradition of philanthropy because the state has always been so supportive of the arts, whereas in, uh, certainly in the, the USA there's a very strong tradition. I'm now seeing a lot more philanthropists in, uh, in Africa coming forward, you know, whether they made money from oil or telecommunications or insurance, people at a certain age and a certain uh, tens of million dollar level, and now want a legacy, you know, they want some kind of legacy to ensure that they're not just known for, for uh, running a bank, but they're known for kind of contributing to society. So I think they, they are, we've always found, no matter how long it takes or how hard it is, there always is some source that will support your film if you try hard enough. Uh, you were talking about um, going outside of the trees on some of the co-productions, and I was wondering um, if you know any of the terminology you've ever used on those contracts, rather than co-production, if you've used co-venture, or what is it that you call it? Yeah, it's a, it could be a partnership, it could be a co-venture. Um, there is another word that I can't think of right now. There's, a, there's another way to describe it, but uh, to me, it's, it doesn't really matter what that word is, it's what the contract says. Uh, what your obligations and rights are. 
uh, but you could, you know, you can't even call it a co-production. It's just not an official co-production. Thank you. I hope my lawyer would agree with me on that. <laughs> okay, well. I think there's a microphone out there somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, maybe just further building on what you just said in terms of some of the scary stories you hinted to in your <laughs> opening, what is some of the protection that you, steps you take to protect yourself from these individuals? <clears throat> and also as someone who is hoping to do a co-production, if you could talk a little bit more about your first kind of co-productions, how those worked out. Um, well, the one very obvious pr protection is to always ensure there's a collection account uh, for the income coming into your film that no one can touch except the collection agent and that's contracted and that uh, it gives you a lot, uh, it, it does cost a little bit of money but it does give you that protection uh, that so for instance if there's a sale for the film and the money doesn't go to the co-producer it goes into the collection account and they have a co the contract between you and the co-producer on how that money split. They take a percentage, of course, for their services, but in that way you ensure that uh, you're not waiting for the, the money from this co-producer. And what you're going to realize when you make a film, you know, a film never dies. It's there, like, beyond, when, when, you know, beyond yourself, and it's a potential revenue stream. Uh, so, and people's lives change, so the co-producer might be great and everything's stable, but who knows what could happen, they could get into financial trouble, they could get divorced, anything can happen, and their priorities change, often their ethics start shifting. So it's really important to have uh, a collection account, to have a third party who uh, controls how that money is distributed. Um, I mean, other things that, that uh, you know, when you're, um, making a film that the money that they're spending in their, they raise the money they're spending in their country and you raise the money in yours, that's ideal. It often doesn't work like that. Often money does have to cross over and that's a risk. I mean, the, the other big thing is that if you went around this festival and you asked everyone, have you ever been ripped off by a sales agent or a co-producer, I would guess every single person would have a story, okay? There are millions, probably billions of dollars of uh, kind of like creative accounting, they call it, okay? I call it theft. It really is a form of theft. And like dishonesty in how one reports to each other. And the only way, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure there are tricks, but you know, you, in your contract it'll say you can audit the other person's uh, accounts. But at that point, the minute you institute that audit, the relationship has broken down. It's like irretrievable at that point. So you've got to make a call, and also the cost of that, that audit in another country and hiring lawyers, et cetera, you've got to weigh that up. The, and that's why I was going on about, you know, really checking people out properly, because there, there will always be ways that people will try these things, and you won't always, especially on documentaries when it's lower budgets, you won't always have the resources to be able to police them and investigate them. So th th there will always be that gray area. I don't have a magic answer for that. But if someone else does, please let me know. <laughs> Stephen, you're, you're coming to us with so much knowledge. And I know your, your question wasn't fully answered. It was a two-parter. But we have to cut the session to start the next one. I want to thank you so much for thank joining you. us. I hope you'll stick around for the cocktail at 5.30 because I, uh, there were a lot of hands up. And I'm sure that more people want to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.